It's now my privilege to introduce the latest addition to the Convention of State staff. He's a man who really needs no introduction. He served roughly two decades in American public life, first as a member of the House of Representatives from South Carolina, then as a member of the Senate. Along with Senator Tom Coburn, who also serves on our staff, he holds a unique distinction of being a member of the House and the Senate who took a term limits promise and then kept that promise. Pretty incredible. After leaving the Senate, he went on to be the head of the Heritage Foundation and lead the development of conservative ideas and policy in America for the last five years. And upon leaving Heritage, I feel really privileged that we were able to attract him to the Convention of States project so he can continue his work as a freedom fighter. You all know him, as I said, as a member of the House, as a senator, as a fighter for freedom at Heritage Foundation. I've come to know him as a friend and co-worker, and it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Senator Jim DeMint. Great to be back here. I can't be in Colorado without thinking of my very first trip here. Uh, my wife and I were 24 years old. We, we were living in North Carolina, and I got a new job back in South Carolina. And we traded in our cars, bought a motorhome, decided to drive all across the country. I didn't have anywhere particular I wanted to go except one place. When I pulled out the map, I circled Golden, Colorado. Growing up, uh, Coors was not sold east of the Mississippi. <laughs> so this, this was like Mecca to me. Now, we went to a few other places, but we ended up at Golden, did the tour, you know, drank as much as they would let us in the sampling room, and then bought 12 cases in the company store there, and had three more weeks on the road. I was going to take it back to my friends and be a hero. But after three weeks on the road, I didn't arrive back in South Carolina with much of that stuff to share. Well, of course, now Colorado has something else that, doesn't sell, that we don't uh, sell east of the Mississippi. But I won't be taking any of that back with me this time. I hope none of you will either. Uh, but it really is an honor to be able to speak to uh, state and local leaders from all around the country and to be a part of kicking off this 44th annual meeting of the American Legislative Exchange Council, an organization that's dedicated to America's founding principles of limited government, free markets, and federalism. Our republic has never been in greater need of rediscovering these principles. Could we just begin today with a round of applause for Lisa and all the Alex staff supporters and me legislative members here? I Thank you all who are working and fighting for better states and a better country. I really appreciate it. You know, I'm here as a former congressman and senator and as one of the many leaders of the national conservative movement to share with you why I believe that what's happening here and at the state level across America is much more important to the future of our country than anything that's happening in Washington, D.C. The pay, the prestige, the media coverage for congressmen and senators uh, may be much better than for state legislators. But the very survival of our nation is now in the hands of the collective states, not Washington politicians. Our federal government has put America on an unsustainable course. And no matter who we send to Congress or the White House, no matter which party is in control, it is no longer politically possible for the federal government to avoid an inevitable disastrous destination for our nation and our fellow citizens. You know, I don't make these statements lightly. As someone who has fought alongside conservative champions like Senator Tom Coburn for over 20 years, I think Tom's here today. Tom, would you put up your hand? I, thank you for all you've done. <clears throat> You know, it's not, it's not easy for us to admit that we have accomplished little more than to slow the growth of spending, slow the growth of debt, the growth of regulations, and the infringement on the rights of states and the American people. No one who has served in Congress or the White House or the federal courts for the past several decades can honestly say that the country is better off now than when they began their service. This is not to say that I'm giving up on electing and supporting Congress, uh, uh, conservatives in Congress. In fact, I've started a new organization to support 
conservative congressmen, senators, and their staffs, and we'll be announcing that next week. Now, we won't be able to balance the budget, but we can fight to slow the growth of spending and debt. We won't be able to return control of education to the states, but we can fight to give states maybe a little flexibility to create more education opportunities for children. We won't be able to eliminate federal control of roads and infrastructure, but we can fight to give states more flexibility and less regulation so that they can build more roads with less money. And, and we can, you know, where it looks like now, it's very unlikely after all the promises that we're gonna uh, repeal Obamacare and eliminate the federal control of health care. But we can keep fighting to give states more flexibility on Medicaid and just maybe give states the opportunity to preserve some modicum of a free market health care system. But if we're really going to stop this, we're going to have to do something much different. We can never give up on Washington because they can do so much damage so quickly. But it is well past time well past time that all thinking Americans agree that Washington will never willingly give up its power. The Washington establishment with its academic propaganda machine, its media allies, its lobbyists, its corporate cronies, its career politicians and bureaucrats, and its worldwide coalition of special interests will never, you know, I repeat, never willingly give up the power and give that power back to states and the people. But we will continue to fight in Washington if for no other reason than to buy time for the states, for all of you, to take the action that our founders envisioned in the Constitution for such a time as this. Many of the biggest problems we face in America today were created by Washington, D.C. And yet so many Americans continue to look to Washington to make America great again. I'm here to tell you that Washington cannot do it, and it will not do it. Our national government was never meant to be what it is. It's treated almost like our God, and it behaves very much like our God. But Washington isn't the master of the people. The people are its master. The federal government didn't create the states. The states created it. Congress isn't our provider, it is we, the people, the work of our hands, the sweat of our brows, the industries and businesses we create that provide the funding that's being doled out by Congress. So who decides the direction of our nation and the policies that will govern us? The people were meant to decide. Right now, Washington is deciding, and that, my friends, is an insult to the founders. It is our failure as we, the people, to achieve what George Washington referred to as the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. Can you imagine if someone had told James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams that the Congress they were creating would one day be deciding what kind of products could be bought and sold in the marketplace, and that Congress would be able to tell us what products we had to buy? What would they say if they were told, or someone told them that the judicial branch, which they created to be the least dangerous of the three branches, would one day declare public policy for every state in the union, every county and town, community and neighborhood, on fundamental issues like education and marriage and abortion? Where is that kind of power designated in the national to the national government in our Constitution? It's not. The founders were so careful to create checks and balances that, that would keep the national government in its place and make it accountable to the people. I, I wonder what they would say if they were told at the time that one day the American people would be subject to 178,000 pages of regulations issued by bureaucrats who were never elected by the people and have no accountability to them. All of this government overreach is bad enough, even if it were accomplishing good things. But as we know, I mean, not only defies the rule of law, the reality is that the federal government not only is, is abusing power and perverting the Constitution itself, but they're ruining our country and hurting many, many people. 
I could re recite plenty of numbers to you to demonstrate how Washington is running our country, ruining our country financially. Numbers like $20 trillion of debt that we're bequeathing to our grandchildren. But the numbers are so huge that it's hard to even comprehend them. And we've been told these numbers and the problems with them for so many years that it's just become white noise. What's every bit as real, though even less tangible, is the moral devastation Washington is wreaking on America. I say that because I believe it is morally devastating for any people to passively accept disabling dependency on government. Too much of what Washington is doing is not only disabling and degrading, but illegitimate, according to the Constitution. It is morally devastating for people to look to government to provide their basic human needs. But what is even what, what so many Americans expect from government today is that the feds have, have basically conditioned them to expect the government to take care of them. So instead of seeing ourselves and, and as people created by God accountable to his laws, as responsible for ourselves, for our fellow citizens, and, and for our government itself, today many Americans see our government as responsible for them. That is morally devastating to a people whose birthright is to govern themselves. We've become so accustomed to the intrusive presence presence of D.C. in every area of our lives, that we've grown complacent about it. And many Americans today don't even know what it looks like to be the ones who decide, as the founders meant us to do. So what are we going to do about it? You know, I'm here today to, that, because I'm proud to be a part of a resurgence of true patriotism that is sweeping the nation through the Convention of States project. The two million plus volunteers that make up its grassroots army have turned away from this idol of big government and are hard at work to spread the word to their fellow citizens. And the word is, the word that they're spreading goes something like this. It wasn't meant to be this way. We were meant to be free. We were meant to decide. That, my friends, is the beauty of America. That is the experiment George Washington referred to over 200 years ago when our nation was in its infancy. The experiment of America is a test of whether a free people can effectively govern themselves under a federal system and whether through self-governance they will pursue virtue. Some conservatives today might be tempted to say that the experiment was a failure. Judging by the weight of our national government that presses down today on, upon individuals and families and businesses, and judging by the extent to which so many have given in to it and accepted it. But the majority of our states that many of you are part of have moved in a more conservative direction, more fiscally responsible and morally empowering. The experiment isn't over yet. It's only reached a new stage. We need to put it back in the right hands. We're at the stage where we find out if the people today have enough hunger for liberty left to do the hard work of restoring it. It's a stage where we set in motion the one constitutional process the founders gave us that is capable of reinstating meaningful limitations on the power of DC. I'm talking about the process in Article 5 of our Constitution the Convention of States process that requires you sitting in this room today to act. The state-led Article 5 Convention is the most powerful of all the checks and balances that the framers created in the Constitution, and we've never used it. If we're serious about putting Washington back in its limited place and restoring the rule of law and self-governance, then we have to use this process. We need you sitting in this room to pass a resolution in your state for an amendment proposing convention. Specifically, we need, a constitu we need constitutional amendments on three topics. Imposing fiscal restraints on the federal government, limiting their power and jurisdiction, and setting term limits on federal officials. How many state legislators are here this morning that their states have already passed this convention of the states, uh, these articles here. Okay, we've got a few in this room and we're gonna be meeting with some more of you. Thank you to all of you. Yep.
We've got to address all three of these areas at an actual convention, a meeting where delegations from all 50 states sit down to discuss and deliberate and draft, edit, debate, and eventually vote on specific proposals. Those proposals, of course, then go back to the states for ratification. Now, I know this is an arduous process, and that, that's why uh, I say we need to address all three of these issue areas at a convention. A balanced budget is a great idea, but it's not enough. I think term limits are a good idea too, but they're not enough by themselves. We need to repair the constitutional limitations on federal power. We have to get DC out of the policy making areas that were meant to be left to the states. I always chuckle a little respectfully, of course, because I once had the same concerns when I hear the criticism that a convention of states to propose amendments to restrain the federal government could turn into a runaway convention with crazy amendments that would take away our rights. We all know that we already have a runaway Congress with runaway spending and debt, a runaway federal bureaucracy that's making more laws and regulations than the Congress, and runaway courts where one unelected liberal judge can change the course of our nation. I'm not a bit concerned with a state convention because all it can do is recommend amendments that must be ratified by 38 states. Folks, if we don't have 13 states that will stop a crazy amendment to the Constitution, we're in a lot more trouble than we can fix. My fellow Americans, the Article 5 Convention of States is the only solution as big as our nation's problem. And I'm convinced that the states and we the people are ready for the challenge to make it happen. Twelve states have now passed the Convention of States Project Resolution, which incorporates these three topics for amendment proposals. I believe the American people will not rest until we have the 34 that we need to call a convention and then usher in a constitutional renaissance. I believe we will succeed in shifting power away from D.C. and back to the states and local level so that we will once again be a nation where the people decide which policies will govern them. Some states and localities will choose the liberal progressive path and some will choose a conservative path. But the point is that the people will again decide. If you want to find out more about this or if you have any questions, I hope you will attend the Article 5 workshop that the Convention of States is hosting after this breakfast. I'll be there along with my good friend Tom Coburn, Mark Meckler, our president, and constitutional scholar, Professor Rob Nadelson. The ultimate hope of, of our founders was in the almighty hand of providence. But to that hope, they joined their courage and their tireless labors to create a nation where self-governance would be possible. I know without a doubt that many of you in this room still place your hope in the almighty hand of God. The question that remains to be answered is whether enough of you will demonstrate the courage of the founders by making your stand through the power the Constitution gives you to restore meaningful liberty and self-governance in America. I don't come here today presuming to know what's best for your states or to tell you how to vote. I'm here to plead for your help in saving our nation and to humbly suggest that the destiny of this last great hope of mankind is in your hands. May God bless you, your state, and our republic, and I thank you. Sign the petition at cosaction.com and get as many of your friends and family to do the same. With your full address, your state legislators will know that you really are their constituents in their district. Our success depends on you, so we're inviting you to be part of history. Let's invoke the constitutional solution that's as big as the problem.